main theorem we want to prove is that every sequence of orthogonal polynomial satisfies a three-term recursion relation. That is to say, it satisfies an equation of this form. x times the nth polynomial is some constant a n times p n plus 1 plus b n times p n plus c n times p n minus 1. This equation allows us to calculate the next orthogonal polynomial in the sequence from the previous two members of the sequence. And here, a n, b n, and c n are just some sequences of constants. Now, I have some freedom when I choose my sequence of orthogonal polynomials. I could take them to either be normalized, uh, so that the integral of a polynomial times itself is equal to 1, or I could take them to be monic, so the leading coefficient is 1. And that freedom translates into some choice about these sequences of constants. So for example, if I wanted my sequence of orthogonal polynomials to be monic, then I'll be looking for a three-term recursion relation where the a n term is just always 1. So x times p n is p n plus 1 plus b n p n plus c n p n minus 1. Alternatively, in the normalized case, the leading coefficient of the polynomials is not going to be 1 in general, so I have to keep that a n. But the c n term is going to be very related to the a n term. In fact, c n will have to be a n minus 1. So before we get into proving our theorem, let's look at an example. I'm going to use one of my favorite examples, which is Chebyshev polynomials. And this is the sequence of polynomials satisfying the condition that when I evaluate it at cosine of theta, I just get cosine of n theta. So Tn of cosine of theta is cosine of n theta. And this uniquely defines my polynomials. Now, if I remember my angle addition formulas, I can remember that cosine of theta times cosine of n theta is the same thing as 1 half times cosine of n plus 1 theta plus 1 half times cosine of n minus 1 theta. And if I use my Chebyshev polynomial expression, this is just saying that cosine theta times Tn of cosine theta is half Tn plus 1 at cosine theta plus half Tn minus 1 at cosine theta. And if we replace cosine theta with x again, this is giving us our three-term recursion relation. We get that x times the nth polynomial is 1 half the n plus 1th polynomial plus 1 half the n minus 1th polynomial. So for this case, a n is constantly 1 half, b n is the constant 0, and c n is the constant 1 half. So these are constant sequences for the Chebyshev polynomial case. Now it's important to note that most of the time, these sequences of the coefficients in the recurrence relation are not going to be constant sequences. For example, we can consider the Hermite polynomials. These turn out to have a nice formula, which says that the nth Hermite polynomial is negative 1 to the power of n times e to the x squared times the nth derivative of e to the minus x squared. To get the three-term recursion relation for the Hermite polynomials, I can start with the expression for the n plus 1th Hermite polynomial. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative of e to the minus x squared inside the parentheses one time, keeping n derivatives outside. This leaves me with the expression negative 1 to the n plus 1 times e to the x squared times the nth derivative of minus 2x e to the minus x squared. Now if I use the product rule, I can rewrite that as negative 2x times the derivative of e to the minus x squared n times minus 2n times e to the minus x squared derivative n minus 1 times. Now just separating things out strategically, I see you get a copy of 2x times hn minus 2n times hn minus 1. So this gives us the three-term recurrence relation that h, x times hn is 1 half of hn plus 1 plus 0 times hn plus 2n times hn minus 1. So for this case, a n is 1 half, b n is 0, and c n is 2 times n. Now, as you might notice, the way that we've obtained these three-term recursion relations for each of these two example families of orthogonal polynomials is we've used some sort of special formula. And most sequences of orthogonal polynomials aren't going to have such a nice formula, so how in the heck are we going to prove that any sequence of orthogonal polynomials will necessarily have one of these three-term recursion relations? The idea here is to explore how these polynomials have to behave inside the inner product. So to start out, let me think about the space of polynomials of degree at most n. And what I want to observe about this space, which I'm denoting by fancy piece of n, is that it's a vector space. It's a vector space of dimension n plus 1. Now suppose I have a sequence of orthogonal polynomials with respect to some weight function r. 
Remember from the definition, this means that pn, little pn, has to have degree n for all n. And as a consequence of this, the polynomials p0, p1, p2, all the way through pn are going to belong to this vector space, fancy pn. Moreover, they're linearly independent because they have different degrees. So I've got n plus 1 many elements which are linearly independent in an n plus 1 dimensional vector space. I know that means that they form a basis. Now that's going to be really important in a minute. So what I want to do now is I'm going to actually pull out my inner product and try to calculate the product of a polynomial q of degree at most n with p of n plus 1. Since I have this basis here, I know that q of x can be written as a linear combination. Alpha 0 times p0 of x plus alpha 1 times p1 of x plus all the way through alpha n times pn. So when I take this inner product here, I can use linearity to write it as a sum of inner products. Alpha 0 times the inner product of pn plus 1 with p0 all the way through alpha n times the inner product of pn plus 1 with pn. And by orthogonality, all of these are actually 0. So what we've shown here is that the inner product of pn plus 1 with q for any polynomial q of degree at most n is going to be 0. So with that in mind, we're actually able to prove our theorem. To prove our theorem, I'm going to think about the polynomial x times pn of x. And pn had degree n, so x times pn of x is going to have degree n plus 1. So it's going to be a linear combination of some constants, beta n0 times p0 plus beta n1 times p1, all the way through beta n n plus 1 times pn plus 1. So now let's think about the inner product of pn plus 1 of x with x times pn of x. As we can see from the linear combination above, when I break it up over the sum, the only thing that's going to survive is going to be beta n n plus 1 times the inner product of pn plus 1 with itself. Likewise, the inner product of pn with x times pn is going to be beta sub n n times the inner product of pn with itself. And I suspect we're noticing a pattern here, and that is that the inner product of pk with x times pn is b sub nk times the inner product of pk with itself. Now to get what I want, I need to realize something pretty neat. The inner product is, by definition, the integral from a to b of pk of x times x times pn of x times our weight function r of x dx. But I can just rewrite this as the integral from a to b of x times pk times pn times r of x dx, which is exactly the same thing as x times pk of x inner product with pn of x. Now if we notice, x times pk has degree at most k plus 1. So this inner product between this polynomial of degree k plus 1 and this polynomial of degree n is going to be 0 unless k plus 1 is greater than or equal to n. So our inner product is 0 unless k plus 1 is greater than or equal to n. And this is telling us that a lot of things are 0. That's saying that bnk times the inner product of k with itself is 0 when k plus 1 is less than n. Now the inner product of a vector with itself is never going to be 0 unless that vector itself was the 0 vector. So what this is saying is that the coefficients, the bnks, are going to have to be 0. So if I'm looking back at my expansion for p times x, we're finding that all of these b terms, these beta terms, are 0, except when k gets close enough to n. So k can be n minus 1, or n, or n plus 1. So that big sum of all of those different p's reduces down to just these three terms. Beta sub n, n minus 1, times the n minus 1 polynomial, plus beta n, n times the nth polynomial, plus beta n, n plus 1, times the pnth plus, po n plus 1 polynomial. 
And so if I just go ahead and take my a n to be beta n n plus 1, and take my b n to be beta n n, and take my c n to be beta n, mi n minus 1, then we see right away this is giving us exactly our three-term recursion relation. And to prove this, I haven't used anything except for the fact that these are this is a sequence of orthogonal polynomials. Now one immediate question that might pop up is, okay, so suppose I define some sequences a n, b n, and c n, and I construct the sequence of orthogonal or the sequence of polynomials that satisfies that three-term recursion relation. Is that going to be a sequence of orthogonal polynomials with respect to some weight? And the answer, under some mild constraints about the coefficient sequences that you choose, is yes. This theorem is called Favard's theorem. And Favard's theorem states that if I have a sequence of polynomials, p0, p1, p2, etc., satisfying a three-term recursion relation, then there exists a function r of x on r satisfying that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of pm times pn is 0 if m is not equal to 0 and equal to some positive number hn greater than zero. Excuse me, this was if m is not equal to n, and this is if m is equal to n. So these three-term recursion relations uh, encode the information of this function r of x and vice versa. And one of the interesting questions you could try to ask is how do I go from my function to my sequences of coefficients or vice versa. And going one way or the, or the other, the process is, more, process is more or less explicit. In one direction, we're doing some sort of Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization to get the polynomials themselves from which we can read off the recursion relation. In the other direction, we're looking at the spectral theory of some sort of uh, infinite dimensional linear operator. We're associating with the, th with the three term recursion relation and using a little bit of spectral theory with that. But having actual explicit examples going in between these two for large families of polynomials, I think, is an interesting question. On a related note, one of the really cool objects that we play with in the context of orthogonal polynomials are semi-infinite tridiagonal matrices, or Jacobi matrices. A Jacobi matrix, J, is an infinite matrix like this one, where the only non-zero terms are occurring on the main diagonal and the first uh, super and sub diagonals. So it's just on that band, which is why it's sometimes called a tridiagonal matrix. Now I'm referring to any semi-infinite matrix like this as a Jacobi matrix, but in the literature, sometimes Jacobi matrices are specifically the ones where this is also symmetric. So it's good to bear that in mind. We can see here that I can encode any sort of three-term recursion relation as a Jacobi matrix and vice versa. So the Jacobi matrices themselves are going to be really very related to our sequences of orthogonal polynomials. The way that they're related is actually through eigenvalues. Specifically, if I remember that those orthogonal polynomials satisfy that three-term recursion relation, then I can calculate the product of my tridiagonal matrix times the vector whose entries are p0, p1, p2, p3, etc. is going to be equal to x times that same vector. So the orthogonal polynomials evaluated at any particular x value give me some sort of formal eigenvector with eigenvalue x. This itself has some really cool consequences. For example, if I look at the n by n truncation of the semi-infinite Jacobi matrix just by scaling the n by n submatrix consisting of the overlap of the first n rows and n columns, then we can show that the eigenvalues of this matrix are exactly the roots of the nth polynomial pn. So this shows that the three-term recursion relation associated with the sequence of orthogonal polynomials is actually carrying all the information of the orthogonal polynomials, and it carries it in surprising ways. But that's a good time to stop for now, so I'll see you guys next time.